Today we are discussing planar holography. And before we talk about what a hologram is, let's talk about what it is not. It is not a photograph. So what is a photograph? So suppose we have some three-dimensional object. And we take a lens. And a certain distance behind that lens, we put a piece of film. Now, of course, it could be, instead of film, it could be an electronic sensor, but we'll just generically call this recording device film. And this lens has a focal length f. And we know that if this film is a distance d2 behind the lens, then a distance d1 in front of the lens, we will have an image plane such that 1 over the focal length is equal to 1 over d1 plus 1 over d2, the imaging condition. So this lens will cause an image of the object in this single plane, z is equal to, uh, say, minus d1, if, if the lens is in the plane, z is equal to 0, and that will then image onto this plane, z is equal to d2. And what happens, of course, is that the light comes off this object, strikes the lens, is modified by the lens transmittance function, and then focuses down to some image. And so what happens is immediately before the film, let's say there's a field G of X and Y there. And that is the thing then that creates the image. But what is an image in a photographic system? It's not a recording of the field itself, but rather the intensity of the field. I of X and Y, which is the magnitude of G of X and Y squared. We call that a photograph. Now, this is the important point. In making a photograph, we have lost most of the information in the field G of X and Y. And to see that, Imagine our object is simply a point source. And so this is, let's say z is equal to zero where our film is going to be. And suppose our object is at x0, y0, minus z0. So it's the distance z0 to the left of the film. And it's a point source, so it emits a spherical wave. So out comes this spherical wave. And then it's that spherical wave that exposes our, quote, film. So what is the G of X and Y then in that case? G of X and Y, well, let's write down just the um, paraxial approximation for a spherical wave. It's A over I lambda Z0, E to the I pi, I'm uh, sorry, 2 pi over lambda Z0 e to the i pi over lambda z0 times x minus x0 squared plus y minus y0 squared. All right. Now, that's what the field is. And of course, that contains information about the location of the point, x0 and y0. In various places. But if we look at the intensity of that, i of x and y, what is that? Well, that's just the magnitude of a squared over lambda z0 squared. And we have lost all info about x0, y0, and z0. You could say, well, Z0 appears here. Yes, but it's in a fraction 
with respect to this unknown amplitude. So unless you knew this amplitude, you couldn't use this to figure out what Z0 is. So we've lost all information about the location of the point source. It could be anywhere in space and create this same uniform intensity. And of course, an extreme version of this would be if you took a camera and you unscrewed the lens so that you just had the bare piece of film or recording medium exposed to the optical field in the room and you pressed the button and took a photo. What would that look like if either you developed the film or you just downloaded the electronic image? Well, it would just be uniform. It would just be gray or white or depending on the intensity, but it would be uniform. You'd see no, nothing in the room. There would be no information, useful information about anything in the room other than there was some light in the room. That's about all you would know. So most of the information in an optical field is actually contained in the phase. Now, of course, what we do in a photography system is we use a lens to modify that phase by multiplying by the transmittance function of the lens, which is basically a phase function, such that an additional amount of propagation causes the intensity on this piece of film to be an image of a particular object plane. But there are limitations to that. First of all, you get only a single plane perfectly in focus. So you've got the problem of depth of focus. And the other thing is you only get one particular um, perspective on that object, right? So you're taking the photograph from over here. If you'd move the, the camera up here or your eyes up here, you would look and see a different perspective of, of the object or move your eyes down here. You could see behind the object and you know, really see the full three-dimensional effect. So we lose all that when we take a photograph. And holography is the idea of trying to figure out a way to capture all of the information that is in this field, g of x and y. So can we somehow figure out a way to record not the intensity, but g of x and y itself? So suppose here is your eye, and here is an object, and that object emits or scatters a field, and that field comes out, and right before your eye, let's say the field is G sub E of X and Y. Now, what you actually see, of course, is a direct result of that field, G sub E of X and Y, rather than specifically the object. Of course, the object creates that field, but what your eye responds to is actually the field that is incident on your eye. So the idea of holography is, here's your eye, and we have a transmittance function, T of X, and why, and we illuminate that, say, with a plane wave, e to the i, 2 pi over lambda z, and immediately after the transmittance, the field is going to be this incident plane wave times the transmittance function. And if we can get that to be g sub e of x and y, well, then your i is going to have exactly the same field incident on it as it did over in this situation. So you're gonna see the same thing. You're gonna see the object even though the object's not there. You're recreating the entire field, not just the intensity, but the phase also. And so that is the process of what we'll call reading out a hologram. So straightforward enough. If we can make a transmittance function such that when it's illuminated by say a plane wave, it creates a field that is the same field that was present when the object was physically present, well, then you're going to see the same thing, including if I move my eye up here, as long as the transmittance function is big enough that I can do this, if I move my eye up here, well, I'm going to see a different perspective on the object. Move down here, a different perspective. If I, instead of my eye, I used a camera, well, when the object's present, 
I can focus the camera at different distances so I could bring into focus different planes on the object. Well, over here, I'd be able to do exactly the same thing because I have the same field to work with. So that would be kind of kind of amazing if we could do that. The challenge is how do we make the transmittance function, which, all right, so in the plane, say z is equal to zero, this incident field would just be one. So the transmittance function would have to be equal to the complex field that would be incident on your eye. And so let's break that up. GE of X and Y as an amplitude, A of X and Y times a phase, E to the I, phi of X and Y. Now the amplitude part is fairly straightforward. That's what a normal film or transparency function could implement that, that A of X and Y. Uh, provided A for a passive medium is between 0 and 1. So it just absorbs some of the light um, to make the light dimmer, to make A smaller, all the way down to 0. The challenge is the phase. Now, conceptually, you might say, well, we could have, say, a piece of glass of a thickness or width W, and that glass could be filled with material an inhomogeneous material with an index of refraction n of x and y. This is say the z direction here. And then if you think about light rays coming through this, so the light ray comes through this absorptive layer and it gets its amplitude modified from say the incident amplitude is one, and this can make then what comes out of there anything between zero and one, and then going through this thickness of glass, well, that could induce a phase, which would be 2 pi over the wavelength times the thickness. That would be in free space, the phase change. And if the index at those values of the x and y coordinates here, corresponding to that ray, is n of x and y, well, then the phase increases in proportion to that index of refraction. So that would be a way to generate this phase term. Or, like we do with a lens, maybe you'd make this uh, piece of glass thicker or narrower in different regions to get more or less phase. Of course, this would have to be greater than or equal to 2 pi over lambda w. So, if you wanted this to be equal to a, a phi of x and y, which could be negative well then you'd have to this would actually be that plus some constant so that the sum here would always be positive greater than or equal to 2 pi 2 over pi a w and of course a, a constant phase added to a field doesn't really have a significant impact on what you would see uh, from that field all right so that might be in conceptually a way to do this um that's hard to do and until relatively recently, there really were no good methods for doing that. Now these days there are some phase-only so-called spatial light modulators that can kind of do this. Uh, but another problem is, and we'll talk about this a, a little bit later, is to make a hologram, we need to have very high spatial resolution. So it's very difficult to do this with an electronic device that can get the kind of very fine spatial resolution like that down say sub micron resolution so this is a real challenge it's it's actually recording the phase of the field so we know we can record the amplitude or the intensity we do that with normal photographic film but how do we record the phase that's the challenge well let's start with a simple case let's see how to record a hologram of a plane wave. So here's our picture. Here's the z-axis. Here's our piece of film. And we're again, we're using film 
generically just to be in any recording medium. And then we have a plane wave. So suppose this is our plane wave that we want to record. And that is g of x and y is equal to some amplitude a0, arbitrary global phase, e to the i phi 0, and then e to the i 2 pi u0 x. So it's tilted in the x direction. So, of course, if we just allow this to expose the piece of film, well, we would just get the magnitude squared of this, which is just uniform. Right? And we lose all information about the direction uh, of propagation of the plane wave. So what we're going to do is we are going to take another plane wave and superimpose it. And this plane wave, we're going to call our reference beam, R of X and Y. And say it has a magnitude AR, E to the I, 2 pi, U R, X. And so we've taken our original plane wave, the, the red beam here, that we want to record, and superimpose on it another plane wave we call a reference beam. And now we have a total field, G sub T of X and Y, which is the original field G of X and Y, plus a reference beam, R of X and Y. And now we expose the film uh, by letting it um, develop in response to the intensity of that field. So this is G plus R magnitude squared. And what is that? Uh, so the magnitude squared of a complex number is the number times its conjugate. And so we are going to assume that that process, once we develop the film or do some analogous electronic process, will create a transmittance that is proportional to that intensity. Now, in practice, um, if this is going to be a passive uh, transmittance function, then t would have to be between 0 and 1. Or we can only um, basically decrease the amplitude of the field by absorbing some of it. We can't increase the amplitude of the field. That would require a, an active medium. But we're going to neglect this because we're only really interested in relative amplitudes. But to be really rigorous, we'd have to make sure our transmittance function satisfied this relationship. All right, so what is this? We'll, so we'll just assume t of x and y is just equal to i of x and y, regardless of what it is. So what would that be? Uh, let's see. i of x and y would be, so we would have um, four terms here. r times r conjugate, that's the magnitude of r squared. Well, that's a r squared. And then g times g conjugate, well, that's the magnitude of g squared. That's a zero squared. And then we'd have the cross terms. So we would have, um, let's see here, we'd have G times R conjugate. And then we'd have R times G conjugate. Okay, so that would be plus AR A0, E to the I phi 0. So this is going to be G times R conjugate. So R conjugate would just give this, instead of an e to the plus i, 2 pi u r x, it'd be e to the minus i. So we would have the original phase factor from g, that would be e to the i, 2 pi u 0 x, and then from the conjugate of the reference beam, e to the minus i, 2 pi u r x. Okay, and then we would have the conjugate of that. So this was g r conjugate, now we'd have r g conjugate, so then our G conjugate would be plus A R A zero from this product. The conjugate of G would give you an E to the minus uh, 
i phi zero. And then we have the conjugate of this term, e to the minus i, two pi u zero x, e to the plus i, two pi u r x. And what is that equal to? So you get your first two terms there, a r squared plus a zero squared. And then this is an expression plus its complex conjugate. So if you add an expression to its complex conjugate, you get two times the real part of that expression. So that's going to be two times AR, A0, and then the real part of this expression. So that's going to be cosine of 2 pi, and we'll write it as U0 minus UR times X, and then we've got the constant phase phi zero. All right, so that is a real and in fact non-negative expression. So that could, that is an intensity and that then could then be used to create a transmittance which is just a real function. It just simply um, absorbs more or less the beam as a function of x and y. Now that's versus what we would get if we just put this piece of film there without the reference beam, which would just be g of x and y magnitude squared, which would just be the amplitude of the original plane wave, a0 squared. So by having an interference between a reference beam and the original plane wave, we've created this cosine function, which has a spatial frequency equal to the difference of the spatial frequencies of those two beams. Now here is what we hope. We hope that if we take this transmittance function, and we illuminate it with our original reference beam, plane wave, like so, we hope that we reconstruct the original plane wave that we're trying to form a hologram of. So let's call this field immediately after the transmittance gr of x and y for the reconstructed field. That's going to be the incident reference beam which we'll assume has amplitude one for simplicity, e to the i two pi u reference x times the transmittance function t of x and y. So here, this just for simplicity, we're assuming the amplitude of the reference beam is one. So let's put in the transmittance function. So this is e to the i two pi u reference x times the transmittance function we had on the previous board, one plus a zero squared uh, with a r is equal to one, plus two a zero cosine two pi u zero minus u r x plus phi zero. So what does that look like in terms of plane waves? Well, to see that, it's better to kind of take a step back. And remember, we got this cosine um, from an expression plus a complex conjugate. So let's invert that process. Here's e to the i 2 pi u reference x. Constant terms in front, 1 plus a0 squared. And then this was 2 times the real part of something. And so we're going to write that as, break it back up as a0 times e to the i 2 pi u0 minus ur x plus phi0, and then plus the conjugate of that, and we'll write it as a0 e to the i 2 pi. And for, for the negative, instead of putting the negative in front of the i, we're going to 
negate u0 minus ur to get ur minus u0 x and then minus v0. So now if we multiply that out, what do we get? Let's see. Well, let's multiply this reference beam times this term here. What's going to happen? Here you've got e to the i 2 pi u r x, and here you've got an e to the minus i 2 pi u r x. Those cancel out, and they leave a0 e to the i v0 to the i Two pi u zero x, and so that is simply our original g of x and y, our original plane wave. So we have indeed recreated or reconstructed that plane wave. But there's some other terms. That's just from this uh, reference beam times this term. What about these other terms? Well, let's see these these first two constants. That'll give us plus. 1 plus a0 squared times the reference beam, e to the i, 2 pi, u reference x. So that'll just be a scaled reference beam. So we showed that here, just some of the reference beam will pass through the transmittance function. And then what about this times that term? Well, here, this product, here you had a plus UR and here a minus UR, those canceled. But here you've got a plus UR and another plus UR. So what are you gonna get there? Well, we're gonna get plus A0, and here you've got e to the minus I phi zero. And then we've got e to the I two pi. So UR plus UR, so that's two UR and then minus u0 times x. So this is another plane wave. And so if we want to really say that we've reconstructed our original field, we have to somehow separate this from these two terms. Well, let's see, think about this in the spatial frequency domain. Of course, we could take this field and pass it through a Fourier transforming lens, and then we would have the spectrum of this. And what would that look like? Well, this would be on the on the u axis. And let's say this is u is equal to zero, and um, let's say u zero is a positive number. This is our original plane wave uh, with a spatial frequency u zero here. So that's u zero, and this is our reference beam. And let's say ur, as shown in this figure, is negative, say over here. And this is 2ur minus u0. So that's twice this minus this positive. So that would be something way down here. All right. So can we isolate this? Yes. If we had, right, so we use the Fourier transforming lens, so this, these beams would focus down to points. And then all we'd have to do would be to block out these two components and then inverse Fourier transform or Fourier transform with a 180 degree rotation. And we would then reconstruct the original plane wave. So we were able to figure out a way by interfering our original plane wave with a plane wave reference beam so that a recording of the intensity of that field contained all the information in both the amplitude and the phase of the original plane wave. And hence, we made a hologram of that plane wave. And we were able to reconstruct that by doing something to separate out that original field plus these other spurious terms that we're not interested in. So, here is an example of a hologram of a plane wave. Right, this is of the form some constant plus a cosine. So in where it's white, that's where it's the brightest, the transmittance near one, and where it's dark, the transmittance is near, near zero. So we'll come back to that in a minute.
Um, the process of separating out the reconstructed plane wave from the other spurious terms often can be done more simply than using a Fourier transforming lens if we assume that our transmittance function fits inside a circle of diameter d, then we're going to have one plane wave component. It's going to come out propagating at an angle theta zero corresponding to the original plane wave. Right? Remember the relation between angle and spatial frequency, theta zero, would be equal to the wavelength lambda times u zero. And then for the reference beam, theta r would be lambda times u r. And so suppose the reference beam comes out here at an angle theta r. Then in some particular plane, if we neglect the diffraction of kind of the, this is like a truncated plane wave coming out of this transmittance function. If we neglect the overall diffraction of the boundary of that transmittance function, this is going to basically just project that those uh, plane waves will cause a projection of this diameter D, which will just propagate at these two different angles. And so what we need for these to separate out, and of course there'll also be another field that goes up down here at an even greater angle. That's the one that goes at, would go at two theta r minus theta zero. So we don't have to, if we can separate these two, this one comes along for the ride. So what we need is if, if this is a distance d from the hologram to where we're actually looking at the reconstructed field, we would need that the separation between the centers of these two which would be the magnitude of theta zero minus theta r, the difference in these angles, times the distance d, so this is the small angle approximation, or precisely there'd be the tangent of this times d, the magnitude of that needs to be greater than or equal to d, because if it is, if the distance between these centers is at least equal to d, then they don't overlap, these two fields. And so what does that give us? using this relation between the u's and the thetas, that gives us that the magnitude of u0 minus ur is greater than or equal to big D over lambda little d. So if we have that relation between the spatial frequencies or equivalently between the, the angles, then these two fields, and, and this third one also, will just naturally separate out. And then we could just look at this or photograph it with our eye or a camera or whatever, and we wouldn't have to have a separate spatial filter. So let's take a look at this uh, simulated hologram of a plane wave over here. So this is one where your g of x and y was a plane wave e to the i 2 pi u zero x, so unit amplitude, no phase offset, and in this case, where u0 is equal to 0. So it was g of x and y was just equal to 1, which is the normally incident plane wave. And the reference beam, r of x and y, was e to the i 2 pi urx, where ur was the sine of minus 20 degrees over lambda. which is um, about minus 0 0.342 over lambda. So in this case, our hologram would look like 2 plus 2 cosine of 2 pi u0 minus ur x. And again, that, uh, that would be 0 minus this. So that would just be this guy here would be 0 0.342 
over lambda. So let's see, let's go over here. So this is 60 lambda by 60 lambda. And in the x direction, let's see, let's count the number of, uh, of fringes. So we go from the origin here, uh, x is equal to zero to, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So we get uh, 10, 10 fringes. That would be 10 peaks of the cosine. In uh, half of the 60 would be 30 lambda. And that's about. So what would that be as far as a spatial frequency? Well, it would be 10 periods in 30 wavelengths or 10 over 30, which is a, a third or about 0.333 periods per wavelength. Okay, and so it actually is about 0.342, so very close to that, just eyeballing it. So you can see what this has, has done is it's created uh, a sinusoidal pattern here, what we'll call a diffraction grading that has a spatial frequency that's equal to the difference of the spatial frequencies of the original plane wave and the reference beam. Now, if we illuminate this by our reference beam, we will recreate the original field. And in this case, u0 is 0, so theta0 would be 0. This would just propagate out directly. And then the reference beam that would be recreated uh, would some of it would tr transmit through this uh, transmittance would go off and then separate if we went far enough away that this condition or this condition was satisfied. Now let's look at the uh, more complicated case of recording a hologram of a spherical wave. So here, our field, g of x and y, will be amplitude a0, global phase e to the i phi 0, and then e to the i pi over lambda z0 times x minus x0 squared plus y minus y0 squared, the praxial approximation to a spherical wave. So our situation is we put our piece of film or other recording device, say in the plane z is equal to zero. And we have a point source over here at x zero, y zero minus z zero. And that creates a spherical wave. And so that is our g of x and y. And just as we did for the plane wave case, we're going to have a plane wave reference that we're going to add into that. And we're going to allow those to interfere in the interference pattern. So r of x and y, where r of x and y is e to the i 2 pi u r x. And therefore, our intensity pattern that we'll record on the piece of film and then turn into a transmittance will look like the magnitude squared of g, so that'll be a 0 squared plus the magnitude squared of r, that's 1. And then we'll have plus... Um, g of x and y times the conjugate of r, so that'll be a0, e to the i phi 0, e to the i pi, pi over lambda z0, x minus x0 squared, plus y minus y0 squared, and then the conjugate of the reference beam, e to the minus i, 2 pi, u r x, and then we'll have the reference beam times the conjugate of g, and that'll just be the conjugate of this term. So that'll be a0 e to the minus i, b0, 
e to the minus i pi over lambda z0 x minus x0 squared plus y minus y0 squared e to the plus i 2 pi u reference x. And that's going to be equal to well, these two constant terms a0 squared plus 1 plus 2 a0 times, well, we'll just have a complex expression plus its conjugate. That's 2 times the real part of the expression. So it'll be 2a0 cosine pi over lambda z0 x minus x0 squared plus y minus y0 squared. And then we're going to have minus 2 pi urx. Let's write that as a product of pi over lambda z0 with minus 2 lambda z0 urx. So just to check, uh, the 2 here would give you 2 pi. So you'd have minus 2 pi. And then the lambda z0 would cancel that. So you get minus 2 pi urx. And then we have then plus the phase phi zero. So that is our intensity pattern, and that'll be then our transmittance function. And the hope is that if we take that transmittance function, t of x and y, and we illuminate that with our original reference beam, that we will recreate, at least to the right of the transmittance function, our original spherical wave. So here's an example of what that might look like. This is a hologram, a simulated hologram, of a spherical wave. And this is for the case x0 is equal to y0 is equal to 0, so that the point source is on the z-axis, a distance z0, which is 100 wavelengths from the film, and the reference beam is a plane wave propagating at an angle with respect to the z-axis of minus 8 degrees, so that it has a spatial frequency along the x-axis of the sine of minus 8 degrees over lambda. So what we're seeing here is a constant plus a cosine, which would be the cosine of from the previous board, pi over lambda z0, x minus x0 squared plus y minus y0 squared, oops, minus 2 lambda z0 you reference x plus phi zero. And let's call that argument of the cosine theta of x and y. And let's see why is the center of this pattern offset from the origin? If the point source is actually on the z-axis, why is not the center of this pattern on the z-axis? It's because of this reference beam. So let's look at where this, uh, this point here would be where the phase stops changing. The derivative of the phase is equal to zero with respect to theta, uh, d theta dy. So in the up and down direction, the y direction. So what would d theta dy be? Well, it would be proportional to, for getting this constant, the derivative of this term, 2 y minus y zero. And setting that equal to zero, that would be that y would be equal to y0 is equal to zero. So the center is at, at y is equal to zero. How about in x? d theta dx is proportional to the derivative of this term, which is 2 
x minus x zero, but then we've got this term, and that derivative gives you minus two lambda z zero u r. If we set that equal to zero, cancel a factor of two, solve for x, you get that x is equal to x zero plus lambda z zero u r. And so that would be uh, zero is x zero. And then we would have plus lambda z zero. So that would be lambda times z zero is 100 lambda. And then u r is the sine of minus eight degrees over lambda. And so two of these lambdas cancel. And then you punch those numbers in, you get minus 13.9 lambda should be the center along the x-axis. And so if you go up here, uh, look, here's the center. So this should be minus 13.9 lambda. And you can see this is 60 lambda all the way across. So half of that, this would be minus 30 lambda here. And this would be zero. And indeed, this is just a little bit less. Midway would be uh, between these two points would be minus 15 lambda. So this is just a little bit to the right of the midpoint there. So that does indeed make sense. So the offset is due to the, due to the angle of the reference beam. Now, if you had a more complicated field that had many point sources, for each one of those, you'd get one of these kinds of patterns, uh, but with different x0 and y0. So the thing would be offset in x and y by x0 and y0. So you get a bunch of these with different amplitudes depending on the brightness of the point source, and they'd all add up, and you get a very complicated pattern pretty quick. Now let's look at the process of recording and reconstructing a hologram of an arbitrary field. So our field G of X and Y, and for now we'll assume also our reference beam R of X and Y are arbitrary. So no limitations placed on those. So we'll assume that we can form a transmittance, which is equal to the intensity of the sum of the field and the reference beam. Magnitude squared of that. So what does that work out to be? That's the field plus the reference times the conjugate of the field plus the conjugate of the reference. And what is that? Uh, let's see, you've got the magnitude squared of the field from the this term times that, then you've got R times R conjugate, that's the magnitude squared of the reference, and then you've got the cross terms. So we'll have a R times G conjugate, and then you'll have R conjugate times G. And so the reconstruction, g of x, g r of x and y, will be a reference beam times the transmitted uh, transmission through the transmittance function t of x and y. And so what will that be? So we'll have r times all these terms. So the first one will have r times, well, let's do times the magnitude of r squared there. And then we'll have r times the magnitude of g squared. And then we'll have r times r g conjugate. So that's r squared g conjugate. And then r times r conjugate times g. Well, r times r conjugate is the magnitude of r squared and then times g. So this last term will be equal to just the field g of x and y, which is what we want to reconstruct, if the magnitude of r squared is equal to 1. And that's true um, if r is plane or 
plane or a spherical wave. So if we take a reference that's a plane wave or a spherical wave, then if we record this hologram and then illuminate it by that reference beam, we will get a term that will be the original field. Then the question is, can we separate that from these other terms? So the only requirement is we need to have the magnitude of our x and y squared to be equal to one. Now, it's simplest to analyze if we assume r of x and y is a plane wave, and we'll specifically take it to be e to the i 2 pi u r x. So have only uh, an, a spatial frequency in the x direction. Now, in general, it could have in both x and y. It's just simpler if we limit it to, to x. Um, spherical waves are a little more complicated to analyze. In practice, for simple holograms, kind of like hobbyist holograms, it's probably easier to use a spherical wave because that can be generated just by a point source, a laser diode or something like that, and you don't need a lens to collimate it. Um, but the analysis is simpler if we assume that this is a plane wave. So we'll, we'll make that assumption. So, we take our reference beam to be a plane wave, e to the i, 2 pi, u r, x. And then our reconstructed field, g sub r of x and y, is that reference beam times the transmittance function. So, we have e to the i, 2 pi, u r, x. And we have the two terms, magnitude of r squared, where that's just one, and then magnitude of g squared. And then we have r squared g conjugate. Now r squared, and this thing squared, would just bring a factor of two into the exponent. So that'd be e to the i, two pi, two u r x g conjugate of x, and y, and then we have magnitude of r squared times g, magnitude of r squared is one, so that is the desired term, the reconstruction of the original field. And now our problem is to separate this term from the others. Can we do that? Let's see. Well, Let's imagine we do a 2D Fourier transform. Then we get the spectrum of this field, big G, R of U and V. And what's that going to be? Let's see. Well, let's take the last term, because that's our desired term, or the original field. That'll just be big G of U and V. And let's see, then this term here, uh, the spectrum of G conjugate, turns out to be big G conjugate of minus U uh, minus V. And then with a factor uh, of a linear phase term like this, we have the shift theorem that causes that to be shifted. So you can show that that's equal to big G conjugate of minus u minus 2ur minus v. And that minus 2ur is from the shift due to the, the shift theorem here. Multiplied by a linear phase factor in one domain, you get a shift in the other. And then let's see. Over here, we've got uh, just the original reference beam. And that will have a Fourier transform, which will just be a delta function u minus u r v. And then the most complicated term is that reference beam times the magnitude of g squared. So we use the convolution theorem for that, and we'll skip over the, the details here. That's equal to the convolution of g and u and v with g conjugate of minus u minus v evaluated at uh, 
u is equal to u minus ur, and v is equal to v. And so what that looks like in the uv plane will be something like this. So here will be our g of u and v, and we'll assume it has some bandwidth v. And then over here, centered at 2ur on the u-axis, uh, will be this term here, and it'll have the same bandwidth. It's just the, the conjugate with a inversion of the coordinates. So it'll be the same same bandwidth. And then this one, when you convolve two, two functions, you get double the bandwidth. So this is uh, centered at ur because of this term, which comes from the shift theorem with this factor. And this guy has a bandwidth of 2b centered at ur. So we can separate out this term here provided there's no overlap between these different circles. And that will be true if this center, which is a distance ur from the origin, so if the magnitude of ur, because ur could be positive or negative, and if it was negative, this would just be over on the negative side of the axis. If that distance is, well, let's see, from here to there is half of this, so that's b, and then from there to there is half of this, so that's b over 2, so it's 3b over 2. So this has to be greater than or equal to 3 halves of b. So if we knew what b was, the bandwidth of the field we're trying to, uh, to record, g of x and y, we could figure out the spatial frequency of our reference beam, our plane wave, and of course that'd be related to the angle at which we have to have that propagating. So let's see how we can, kind of with the back of the envelope calculation, get an estimate for this bandwidth b. So, let's assume that our object fits within a sphere of diameter d sub o. And then over here is our hologram, and that fits within a circle of diameter dt for the transmittance function. And let's assume that the di distance between the center of that sphere, and our, so our object's in here, and the hologram is little d. Then, let's look at the largest angle we could get for a ray coming from this object and hitting the hologram. So if we go at the very bottom of this sphere to the very top of that hologram, that would be some angle called theta. And then, Of course, we're also going to have our plane wave reference, and that's going to come at some angle theta r. So our question is, what is the largest that the angle theta can be? Because remember that angles for plane wave, the angle theta is equal to lambda times the spatial frequency u, if you're just looking in the, in the x direction. And we assume this is all symmetric about the the z-axis here, so this could be either the x or y dimension. Okay, so u, the spatial frequency then, is theta over lambda. So what will be magnitude of theta max? Well, let's see, let's just use trigonometry, and we're going to use a small angle approximation, so the vertical dimension is, well, this, this guy here is d0 down, and then here is dt up, over 2, d0 over 2, and dt over 2 down to up. So the total distance from this point down to there, vertically, is going to be dt over 2 plus d0 over 2. And then we divide that by the horizontal distance, d, and in the small angle approximation, that would be equal to the angle. It's actually equal to the tangent of the angle, but tangent's about equal to 
the angle and the small angle approximation. So what is the corresponding maximum value of u? Well, u is just that angle over lambda. So that would just be, um, we could write it this way, d0 plus dt over 2 lambda little d. And then what's the bandwidth? Well, the bandwidth is twice that, because we'd have, this would be a positive spatial frequency, but then we'd have a mirror image going from up here to down there, which would be the negative of that. The difference of those would be twice this. And so that would be d0 plus dt over lambda little d. And more generally, if you think about just rotating this around the z-axis, um, that would be instead, say, 2 times the square root of u squared plus v squared, the max value of that. Okay, so that's the bandwidth. And now what we saw in the previous board was we need the spatial frequency of our reference beam to be greater than or equal to 3 halves this bandwidth. Well, what is that? That's 3 halves d0 plus dt over lambda d. And now if we go to, want to go to angles theta, well, we just multiply by lambda. And so that would give you that the magnitude of the angle of the reference beam would have to be greater than or equal to 3 times, well, let's see, this is three times, what is it, d0 plus dt over two lambda d? That's u max. If you get rid of the, multiply this by lambda, then you get this expression, just dt plus d0 over two d, that's theta max. So this would be greater than or equal to three times theta max. So that's our condition to be able to separate out the reconstructed field. We need to have the angle of propagation of the reference plane wave be three times the largest angle that we can get for a ray leaving this object and striking our holographic uh, recording medium. So that's pretty easy to, to figure out. And of course, this way we've drawn this here is, generally speaking, this is kind of a grossly exaggerated. They're squished up along the z-axis. We'd usually have these spread out more along the z-axis. So there's an easy condition. Now, one subtlety for recording holograms is that you usually you can't do this with standard film. And usually also not with standard electronic uh, imaging devices. Because standard film might have a resolution, which is, say, maybe about 15 micrometers, micrometers, um, sorry, uh, microns, 15 microns. And you would have, for film, uh, there's no concern with phase. You're just worried about recording amplitude. So the film does not have to be optically flat. It could be kind of bumpy. So instead, for holograms, we usually use holographic plates. So it's a emulsion that's on a, a flat plate, and those can have resolutions, say, on the order of half a micron. And they will be optically flat, so it won't introduce any random phase. So that's usually a general, a specialized recording medium that you would get just for holograms. And to do that with electronic devices, that, that's a little challenging. You need to have very, very small pixels. Uh, but if you do have small enough pixels, you could record a hologram electronically, and then you'd get into the realm of digital holograms, especially if you then reconstructed the hologram using some kind of electronic sp so-called spatial light modulator rather than a transmittance function based on a holographic plate.
Now, our analysis of a hologram of a plane wave leads us in to a discussion of diffraction gratings. So, let's say we have a transmittance function that is, as we would get from recording a hologram of a plane wave, so you have the form 1 half times 1 plus the cosine of 2 pi, and let's say u sub g of x. And that's a non-negative real expression. Let's write that as 1 half plus, and write the cosine as one, cosine of x is 1 half e to the ix plus 1 half e to the minus ix, so that would then be 1 fourth e to the i 2 pi ugx plus 1 fourth e to the minus i 2 pi ugx. And now we're going to call that a diffraction grating and illuminate that with um, a plane wave, e to the i 2 pi u sub i x. So what are we going to get? What is the field that we're going to get? Well, that's g of x and y. And we got three terms here, so we'll get three plane waves. The first one will just be one half the incident field, so one half e to the i, 2 pi u i x. And then we'll get uh, here, we'll get one fourth. And the product of these two, well, we'll just add the exponents, and that'll just give us a u i plus u g. So it'll be e to the i, 2 pi, ui plus ugx and then for the second term you're just going to have a minus ug instead of the plus ug so that'll be one fourth e to the i 2 pi ui minus ugx so what does this look like well, here's our transmittance function t and suppose this is our incident field, spatial frequency ui. Well, after the transmittance, we still have that incident field, but reduced in amplitude by a factor of a half. And we're going to call that the zeroth order diffraction. Okay, so that has spatial frequency ui. Then this one will have a spatial frequency ui plus ug, something like that. We're going to call that the plus one diffracted order. So that has spatial frequency ui plus ug. And then this one has a minus ug. We'll call that the minus one diffracted order, spatial frequency ui minus ug. And of course, we know that there's a relation between spatial frequency and angle theta is lambda u. So this corresponds to theta i is lambda ui. And then if we say theta g is lambda ug, then this guy is at an angle theta i plus theta g. And down here, it's theta i minus theta g. So when this plane wave comes in, you get three plane waves, the zeroth order, which is just the original incident plane wave, the plus one order, which has an angle that increases, and the minus one order, an angle that decreases. Now, let's see what happens um, if we have a more general type of transmittance function that is not just simply one plus a cosine. More generally, we might have a diffraction grating that was periodic, but not as just a simple cosine. So it might be of the form a0 plus the sum m equals 1 to infinity a sub m cosine 2 pi m u g x. So a Fourier series of a, of a uh, function with even symmetry. And this can be broken up as a0 plus one half 
the sum over m, 1 to infinity, of a m, and the cosine is written as then as 1 half e to the i, 2 pi, m u g x, plus the conjugate, e to the minus i, 2 pi m u g x. So now again, we illuminate with some incident plane wave, e to the i 2 pi u sub i x. And what do we get? Uh, well, we get this times the a0, so we get a0 e to the i 2 pi u i x. And then let's see, for the m is equal to 1 term, we're going to get um, 1 half a1 ui is going to add with ug so that'll be e to the i 2 pi ui plus ugx and then from the conjugate term we're just going to get a minus ug so it'll be 1 half a1 e to the i 2 pi ui minus ug x and then for m is equal to 2 we'll get 1 half a2 e to the i 2 pi ui plus 2 ugx and then the conjugate term will be 1 half a2 e to the i 2 pi ui minus 2 ugx and so on so, for example, we might have a transmittance function, say, which is kind of have this blocky kind of structure, like a sum of rect functions, uh, which you could get, you know, maybe by machining out or chemically etching out from an opaque screen some openings. And, of course, this would have to then be expanded in a Fourier series of this form. And so, in that case, what you would get from... illuminating this with a plane wave is you'd get this would be your zeroth order that would just be the original incident wave with a modified amplitude you get a plus one order that'd be this one here you get a minus one order that'd be this term there then you also get a plus two order that'd be this one here with a plus two ug and a minus two order diffracted wave that'd be with the minus two ug and etc you get all these different orders from the harmonics of these different cosines with different values of m so more generally a, a diffraction grading like of this form would give you lots of different diffracted waves plane waves so finally let's look at what happens if we have a diffraction grating, some transmittance, and we illuminate it not with light of a single wavelength, but with white light. Light with all possible wavelengths. So uh, we're going to get some zeroth order diffraction. That'll just be the original wave that'll transmit through. But then because, so let's say our theta incident is lambda u incident and let's take that to be zero and our theta grading is lambda u grading so notice what happens for a certain spatial frequency in our grading right, so we have a certain oscillation frequency for different lambdas will the diffracted fields will go off at different angles and the larger the wavelength the larger the angle so uh, for the uh, the shortest wavelength, which would be blue, we would get, say, field going off at theta blue and plus and minus that. And then green, which is a, a longer wavelength than blue, would go at a larger angle. And then red, which is the longest of all the visible wavelengths, would give us the largest angle of diffraction.
So what a diffraction grating would do with white light is to separate out the different colors, cause uh, plane wave components to propagate at different angles. So this would, of course, break light into its spectral components. That's similar like a prism would do. But a prism uh, uses dispersion, while for a, a grating, it's much cleaner. It doesn't depend on the optical properties of glass, but simply on this mathematical relation between the grating frequency and the diffracted direction, the diffracted angle. So you can use this, and this is sometimes used to, to form and build an optical spectrum analyzer. So you could imagine uh, having this uh, transmittance function, say one plus cosine of two pi u grading x times a half. You could imagine light coming in here. Let's just say it has two wavelengths, just to illustrate. That's our fraction grading here. Now that's gonna break that light up and the plane waves to go at two different angles. And so what we could do is then have a Fourier transforming lens. And what that's going to do is to then cause those two plane waves to focus down to two different points. So one would go to, say, lambda 1. Um, sorry. Lambda 1 UG. And the other would go to, say, lambda 2 UG. And so you would get these two points in that back uh, focal plane, which would correspond to the different wavelength components. And so you could just then have a little array of uh, photosensors, and each of those would then read off the corresponding power in those different wavelengths, and this would be an optical spectrum analyzer.